Okay, so I'm literally in between patients. In fact, we had a cancellation, so I'm going to take this opportunity to do my second video regarding the coronavirus family. So we've already talked a little bit about their history. These are single strand RNA viruses that love the lungs. That's where they do their damage. We talked historically about 2002 SARS, 2012 MERS, and then of course in 2019, we're living with COVID-19. Now, in this video, what I wanna go over is, well, where did these come from? And that's where you have to get familiar with a term called zoonotic. Zoonotic, think about the fact that it starts with zoo, animal life, and these are viruses that are transmitted from other animal species to human beings. And this is an important part of what you need to understand about what we're dealing with here, because I'm hopeful that it'll be one of the ways that we ultimately end up addressing how to not let the next one happen. So let's go back to 2002. After the dust settled, scientists, epidemiologists, forensic pathologists, whoever was involved discovered that we ended up acquiring it from bats. So this is a theme that's gonna play out over and over again, it's important. Then we had MERS in 2012. Just a little factoid, MERS was also called the camel flu. And that's because camels gave it to humans, but guess what? Camels got it from bats. Now, this is an instructive uh, moment in time because again, Bats are, is a common theme, but there's this intermediary, a camel, and to this day, we don't know how the virus transmitted from bats to the camel and then from the camel to human beings called, causing the MERS. But we do know that sometimes the coronavirus can't make the leap from bats directly to humans, and instead it needs an intermediary. Back in 2012, that intermediary was the camel, which is why it was called at one time the camel flu. And now let's get to 2019 and the current pandemic that we're dealing with, which is COVID-19. So while the dust has not fully settled, there are some interesting theories about how we as humans acquired it. And the way that I think the leading theory is that there was an intermediary, which we'll talk about in a second, and then the ultimate source was bats. Now. The intermediary here is this bizarre little creature called a pangolin. Now, a pangolin is a tiny anteater that's found in the jungles of Malaysia. It's smuggled from there to mainland China where it's consumed as an exotic wild animal. And the leading theory suggests the following, that it was the virus from bats, because, so let me just take this right now. The natural reservoir for the coronavirus family, these single-strand RNA viruses that can cause tremendous harm to human beings, all of them just have as a natural reservoir, a place that where it's their safe place, is bats. Bats don't harm them, and they, in turn, don't harm the bat. And so they can exist generationally for hundreds of years in bat communities. It's when bats and human beings intersect that trouble arises. We know that historically, that when SARS happened, it was transmitted from bats. When MERS happened, bats to camels to human beings. And now in 2019, what we're all living through, it's bats jumping to pangolins, the virus, I should say, jumping from bats to pangolins, and then from pangolins, it jumped to human beings who consumed pangolins. So is that where it ends? Is that where the story ends? Is that that's how human beings get it? Well, yeah. Logically, if that's all that it took to get a human being sick, then it should only kill the person that ate the pangolin, the person that was near the camel. But here is the rub. This is what makes these viruses potentially so dangerous, is that once they get into the human host, it doesn't take them long to mutate until they're able to say, I can jump from one human to another. And that's when the race is on. As soon as there is transmission from human to human, oftentimes or usually due to respiratory droplets, that somebody coughing, sneezing, or as we're learning now, even just breathing or talking to you, it's enough for you to get the virus from one human being to another. So in each of these instances, that happened. Now, if you recall from my previous video, 10% mortality 
with SARS, 30% mortality with MERS, and 1% to 3% mortality with COVID-19. There are some sobering things that you need to know. SARS killed 10% of the people that it affected, and yet despite that, we were not able to get a vaccine, so no vaccine, and no real drugs. There were no drugs that we ever discovered that treated it. Then we fast forward now, a decade later, supposedly our science has improved, our technology has improved, and guess what? MERS is killing 30% of the people that it infects, and despite that fact, no vaccine and no drugs. Okay, let that sink in. Because now we're dealing with COVID-19, and yes, there's a lot of chatter about hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, antivirals, uh, even other agents that might be of some benefit, and I've got news for you. History, there's a reason why we look at history, because history tells us a lot about the future. So there is no drug that can treat COVID. And I have on my Instagram page the, at the Gutsy MD a whole post that I've made looking at hydroxychloroquine because it's gotten a lot of press. And currently we have no vaccine. Now, this is where I want to strike a more optimistic and hopeful note before we wrap up this video. Even though right now there is no vaccine, and, and I was of the opinion that we probably, just like in 2002 and just like in 2012, we're not going to get another vaccine. This is just going to be something we have to write out and people are going to die, so on and so forth. I think there's real hope. There's real hope that there was enough research done back in 2002 because remember, the virus that causes that caused SARS, that thing is called SARS-CoV-1. And the one that causes COVID-19, that's called SARS-CoV-2. That isn't just cool nomenclature that tells you that these two viruses are structurally very, very similar. That means that they're antigenic markers. The things that trigger an immune response are very, very similar. And I'm holding out hope that enough research was done about 20 years ago that we can then use as a foundation in order to start developing a vaccine on a very accelerated rate. I read an article last night that said that the University of Pittsburgh has already developed a potential vaccine that has been tested in mice models and it's shown a great response. And there's other people all over the world, other research entities that are developing vaccines. And so I'm gonna hold out hope folks that we may end up with a vaccine at some point in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, let me urge, if you're counting on a medication to fix you if you get ill, you're on a fool's errand. If you're waiting for a vaccine in order to fix this problem, you might be waiting a while. So social isolation and aggressive testing and monitoring of the population remain the backbone of our defense system against this pandemic.